Tashle, Namaste, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the organizing committee of the 34th Kalachagra, I welcome you all to this press conference, which will be addressed by Honorable Si Kiong of the Central Tibetan Administration, Dr. Lapsang Sange. The press conference will deliberate on the ongoing Kalachagra initiation and uh, uh, and the organizational uh, undertakings. Uh, Dr. Sange will speak about 10 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for question and answer session. Uh, uh, so I request everyone to kindly introduce yourself and the media uh, that you represent before asking your questions. Uh, please make your questions as, as brief as possible, as we do not have much time at our disposal. We can accept one question per person. Thank you. And uh, may I now request Honorable Si Kiong to address the press. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the uh, 34th Kala Chakra, organized by uh, Central Tibetan Administration and sponsored by very generous contributors. And we consider it very auspicious uh, that uh, in Bodh Gaya, the place where Buddha attained his uh, Nirvana, uh, is where His Holiness the Dalai Lama is blessing us with Kala Chakra. And this will uh, generate a lot of uh, positive karma to the people who are receiving the Kala Chakra. And then we hope there will be transformation within one individual because His Holiness is the manifestation of Buddha of compassion. So once you receive a teaching on compassion and loving kindness from His Holiness, there is no one better teacher than him. He is the greatest scholar of Nalanda tradition. For Tibetans, he is the life and soul of Tibet. For humanity, he is the manifestation of compassion. So to receive Kala Chakra, from His Holiness is very special. And each individual who have come here will go back more compassionate, more peaceful, back to their own homes and countries, and spread the message of peace around the world. So hence, that's why we say we are organizing the Kala Chakra here in Bodh Gaya for world peace. That's one reason. Another reason is to earn collective positive karma for Tibetan people as a whole, inside and outside, so that through this positive karma, Tibetan will be stronger, more determined, more united to pursue our you know, freedom struggle as well. And this Kala Chakra is also special, of course, due to pressure from the Chinese government. Many Tibetans could not come to Bodh Gaya, and some of them who came had to leave abruptly against their wishes because of the pressure from the Chinese government. And as His Holiness has said, from this ground of Bodh Gaya, they will receive Kala Chakra inside Tibet as well. So not only there is a spiritual transmission of Kala Chakra from Bodh Gaya to Tibet, but there is a virtual or through Tibet TV, direct transmission of Kala Chakra throughout the world, including those inside Tibet. So hence, Tibetans around the world are receiving Kala Chakra, and our friends and Buddhists around the world are receiving Kala Chakra. So for that, uh, as CTA, as the organizer, we are very grateful that we could be able to take part in this, because this is the 34th Kala Chakra, but this is the first ever organized by Central Tibetan Administration in the last 50 plus years. So hence, responsibilities are enormous, but our volunteers are working day and night. I come up and say a few things, but it's the volunteers who are running around. And our staff members, and if you see some of them, you'll, from their uh, tan faces and neck, tan neck that they have, you can clearly make out that they've been working very hard. And uh, also we have uh, Magad University providing us space. We have Kaju Malam providing us space. And there are other so many NGOs doing a lot of beautiful things. And as uh, the main organizer, I want to extend deep appreciation to all the volunteers, to all the organizers, especially 
especially to the government and the people of Bihar. Uh, the Honorable Chief Minister Nitish Kumarji himself came to Bodh Gaya to inspect the preparation on 23rd of December. And the DM and SSP and their team is fully engaged from many, many months to make this uh, event a success. So we are very grateful. So, and uh, as an organizer, we feel things are going quite smoothly. Even the Lord Shiva and Indra has given us good weather. So we want to thank the almighty lords also for making this possible. Because one rain could jeopardize a lot of things. So as I always say, I take great pride in saying that Indian government has done the most to the Tibetan people on all aspects of things, particularly on Kala Chakra as well. So we are always very grateful. 150,000 Tibetans, especially His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is seeking refuge in India for the last 50 some years. But we also feel, as Tibetans, as a place where there is Mount Kailash and Mansarovar, we also feel we've been granting maybe some refuge to Lord Shiva for 5,000 plus years. So, I mean, I'm very grateful to Lord Shiva and Indra for blessing us with good weather as well. So, with that note, I want to say thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to address. Thank you. The, there's one question. Chinese government, is, they, they're denying, refuting, that they put some pressure on Tibetans uh, to attend the pilgrimage. The refutation made by the Chinese government that they have put any pressure on Tibetan pilgrims to attend Kala Chakra or even visit Buddhist sites in Nepal and India are baseless. That their refutation that they're saying they have not put pressure is not true. Because I have personally met hundreds of them, tears in their eyes, saying after so many years of making efforts, finally they got passports. Finally they have valid visas to come to Nepal, come to India for simple reason, to visit the place where Buddha has attained enlightenment. Now, not just tens, not just hundreds, thousands of them scrambled and ran back because they got calls saying the Chinese police visited their homes, threatened their family members of cutting off their subsidies, their jobs, or threatened for my, more dire consequences if they don't return between January 1st and January 15th. So some Tibetans told me, Chinese government always say Tibetans have freedom. Where is the freedom? Chinese government always say the white paper that they've issued always say Tibetans are the master of their own region. Who are the master is very clear. In fact, there is not even religious freedom now. So they have done everything legal. Getting passport is a legal process. Getting visa is legal. Going to Buddhist sites in Nepal and India is legal. And threatening them to return immediately under such severe pressure is simply unacceptable. Hence, Chinese government is in clear violation of international human rights norms their own constitution, their own laws, which says that there is religious freedom. So hence what they're saying is baseless. On the other hand, what they're saying is, well, if we want to put some restrictions on Tibetans, then we would not issue them passport to begin with. But it can be categorically and factually stated that 90% of the Tibetans are not issued passport, whereas large majority of Han Chinese are issued passport. So when Chinese government and other countries talk about Chinese booming tourism of Chinese tourists, that means Chinese government issued them passport. Hence they are traveling around the world. 
They travel even to places like Taiwan, Hong Kong. But Tibetans are denied passport to begin with. They have to wait very long and find different ways to get their passport after many years. And even those who have, those few Tibetans who got passport, they have come here for teaching and they have to go back. So if Chinese government really wants to prove us wrong, then I urge the Chinese government to issue passport to 100% of Tibetans, let them travel around the world, then truly we can say they are the master of their own region. Chinese government is actually issuing passport to 100% of Tibetans and they can travel around the world. They need not come to Dharamsala. We are not asking them to come to Dharamsala. They did not come. But let them travel around the world. First issue them passport. So this is simply unacceptable. Hmm. His question was, by putting this kind of pressure on Tibetans from Tibet, uh, does it affect any way the middle way policy and dialogue between envoys of His Holiness Dalai Lama and Tibetan people or not? I said they are separate issues, related, but it can be separate as well. If you look at Palestine-Israel issue, there is an ongoing conflict, but there is ongoing dialogue. Even in Northern Ireland, there was ongoing conflict, but there was ongoing dialogue and finally resolution also. So hence, what's happening this time is simply unacceptable, and we criticize in the strongest terms as far as Tibetan pilgrims from Tibet not allowing to visit uh, Nepal and India. But at the same time, our policy of middle way policy remains. Dialogue between the envoys of the Dalai Lama and the Chinese government should take place. That continues to be our policy. Hmm? Yeah, international platform is dig raha hu. Mere ko aha, ab log sab international se aaya hai. So yes, I know. Um, we just released a report title. Tibet is not part of China, but middle way remains a viable option. So this is a report by the Central Tibet Administration. We have made it very clear that historically Tibet was an independent country. Presently, Tibet is under occupation and there is political repression, environmental destruction, economic marginalization, cultural assimilation, and social discrimination. But we feel middle way is the viable option. So this report was published in Delhi, and we had a day-long conference. And this, we will be carrying the message around the world. So that's our message. So obviously, uh, because of that report, we approach the related agencies and officials of the United Nations. Our representative office in Geneva approached the UN uh, Human Rights Commissioner, staff there, and we have put forth our press release, uh, our, uh, the release of the book and the report. And recently we have also condemned the demolition of Larungar Monastery an expulsion of nuns from Yachengar. And this is another indication that the Chinese government is almost recreating or reviving the cultural revolution-like situation in Tibet. What is cultural revolution? Demolish monasteries, disrobe monks and nuns, expel them, not allow them to practice religion, so these are the things that are happening in Tibet now. And also the putting restrictions and calling back all the Tibetan pilgrims from mere attending a spiritual event is also indication that there is repression in Tibet. 
So these are all cultural revolution-like situations, similar to cultural revolution. Hence, we criticize it very strongly. So we will be raising this in the international forum. Particular future, I say, future is good because we Tibetans believe in Buddhism. And I think it makes perfect statement to say it from Bodh Gaya. This is where Buddha attained his enlightenment 2,500 some years ago. So Buddhism is that old. And we are still strong and alive and message of Buddha is spread around the world by none other than His Holiness Dalai Lama. Communism is 100 years old. Karl Marx died long time ago. Lenin died. Mao Zedong died, Teng Xiaoping died, and recently Fidel Castro also passed away. So you can clearly see 100 years old Marxism and 2,500 years old Buddhism has no competition. Hence our future is bright because we will be there for another 2,500 years. So philosophically speaking, why Tibetans are so committed, in some ways take some pride is we are small in number as far as population is concerned. We are just six million. But our deep-rooted Nalanda tradition of India is inherently in us, within us. So even though Buddha, Buddhism was born and brought up in India, but I think none other than His Holiness Dalai Lama is carrying the loudest and the perfect message of Buddhism around the world. So as a chela, we have done so well. The best preserved Buddhist texts and Buddhist scriptures and Buddhist teaching is in Tibetan language. So we are that capable as people. Hence, if you compare with 100 years old Marxism, I think we are absolutely confident that we will prevail. Our policy is a middle way approach. That's our mind. So genuine autonomy is as per Chinese laws and within China. So Chinese constitution says Tibetans have autonomy. Minority Nationality Act of 1984 says Tibetans have autonomy. Chinese government issues white paper every two, three years, and they say Tibetans are the master of their own region. They have autonomy. So we say, if you are saying this, if your document says so, we want to see in the ground, implement it, then we will believe. Otherwise, there is no autonomy. Ground reality is different. Genuine autonomy. Genuine autonomy, we, it's in the constitution. What are we saying? Implement it genuinely. Autonomy. Genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people, not independence. Uh, question is, how is His Holiness Dalai Lama going to establish with the new administration in the United States? As we normally do, we wait for the new president-elect to take the oath on January 20th. Once the government and the staff members are set accordingly we contact and uh, uh, build relationship so we know president-elect donald trump has appointed uh, or nominated a secretary of state and various uh, national security advisors and various other officials we are keenly following who are the staff members and their past background uh, and then based on which we will build our relationship. But we are very hopeful, given the past administration, all have met with His Holiness Dalai Lama. President Bush Jr. met His Holiness Dalai Lama four times. President Obama met His Holiness Dalai Lama four times. And in 2012 and 2014 and 2016, White House had applauded and supported the middle way approach policy of Central Tibet administration as envisioned by His Holiness. So we are very hopeful the new administration will continue with the past practices of meeting His Holiness Dalai Lama and supporting middle way approach.
Okay, with that note, thank you very much. Ani Tuchena.